Good afternoon and welcome to the Midday News. Here's what we have in the bulletin. Massive bushfire causes a loss of over $4 million in St. Elizabeth. Attorneys concerned about upcoming changes to Bail Act. And later in sports, JFF executive unaware of a letter sent to Dalton Wint. I'm Krista Campbell. Here are the details. We begin with news that the parliamentary opposition, the People's National Party, PNP, continues to criticize the Andrew Honest-led administration, this time over its handling of rising food prices. Sandy Williams has that story. It's a very serious time here in Jamaica. It's a very serious time in the world. Opposition, Opposition leader Mark Golding addressing constituents in Belfield, St. Mary recently. Mr. Golding laments the ongoing war in Ukraine has disrupted supply chains globally, which he believes is threatening the country's food security. He says the impact has manifested into inflation and spiraling prices of some basic commodities such as fuel, agricultural chemicals and poultry. Mr. Golding reasons that these are making life more difficult for many Jamaicans. Right now, minimum wage is 9,000. We, we tell them it should be 12,000. We are committed to raising the minimum wage to make it a livable wage. But when you check a stack, 9,000 divided by 40, a 40-hour 40 working week, $225. A party selling for 240. So what I want work can even buy a party if you're in the minimum wage. And that's the situation of the people in this country. Mr. Golding says the government has not done enough to protect citizens against the rising prices, adding that the government has been ignoring the PMP's recommendations, which are aimed at cushioning the increasing prices in the local market. And we told them, cushion the prices. Just take 2% of GDP, $40 billion, and use it this year to make the people survive the inflation crisis, the cost of living crisis on the people. We said, top of the pension, the NIS pension, the social pension, top of the poor relief, top of the part benefit, and provide some proper subsidies for the farmers with the fertilizer so they can produce the food. Mr. Golding adds that the Andrew Honest led administration has failed to achieve economic growth because it is too focused on reducing the country's debts. This is not a time to be fixated about balancing the budget and bringing down the debt at the same pace as we've been bringing it down. We can slow the pace of debt reduction. Mr. Golding says the people will be their priority if they become victorious in the local government election. The people of Jamaica are depending on the PMP to do it again for them because the plan is in and look dark. And we are here to bring some light. Sandy Williams, TVJ News. Now to St. Elizabeth, where a massive bushfire ripped through Clement Park near Peter Cross on Tuesday. 35 acres of land was engulfed in flames, damaging crops and equipment worth over $4 million. Kelisha Williams reports. Firefighters battling Tuesday afternoon's bushfire on farmlands in Clement Park, St. Elizabeth. The wind and sun made it more difficult to control the blaze. By the time they extinguished one section, the flames quickly spread to other areas. Three fire trucks had to be used to pour water on the already scorched land. Minutes later, the destruction was even more glaring. Crops and equipment spread across 35 acres of land were all gone. I'm going to get a car and get a car and fire over my place too. Yeah. And uh, when we come over here, we find out that my jeep was and my onion and, and beetroot burn up, burn up. And my guinea grass. My dad farm till 12 o'clock and, and ride out. And after my dad yard, about 9 o'clock, I was get a car and fire the farm, you know. The farmers told us it was a significant loss, over $4 million in losses. They said it is especially difficult as they were already battling a critical water shortage in the area. And now this. I sent me back a lot, you know. Yeah, I sent me back a lot because I drive with her and we don't get no water. So, a big loss is that. I can't explain, my brother. I tell you the truth. I can't explain, God knows. Kelisha Williams, TVJ News. 
Now to a bit of good news now, a single parent father in Seaview Garden, St. Andrew, has reunited with his son after being forced to live apart when fire ravaged their home more than a year ago. Jamila Maitland has their story. Collington Graham and his son are now sleeping more comfortably after receiving a new house under the government's social housing program. Mr. Graham, who was visibly shaken at the ribbon-cutting ceremony on Friday, revealed that he lost his house back in October 2020 to fire. Currently, I let the camera put in a polished tin, so it's unbalanced and turnover. So when I come now and open the door, you know, it's a fire it and push me outside. And, you know, and so when I rushed to the hose, no water, water gone. And, you know, I said, fire! And you know, the people them come, the youth them jump on the man, and water and I jump over there, so water and I tank and you know, the people them jump on the head. The single father who takes care of a teen son said life hasn't been good since. His son was forced to live with his grandmother to provide more stability while he couched up. Now, his son can return home and sleep comfortably. Oh my, the spread out. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Dozens of residents cheered on the family as they received the keys to the house, a few of them hoping that they will also receive one. But houses like these are for a special group of Jamaicans who are living below the poverty line or have fallen on hard times. West St. Andrew MP Anthony Hilton says he's received several requests from constituents in need of housing assistance. However, he says apart from being in need, land ownership is also important. In many instances, people are burned out and they have no tenorship, and the person who actually has, has tenure is not interested in rebuilding or letting to the, the same persons. Sometimes the fire for them is a relief because they get rid of someone, a tenant they want to get rid of. So those situations exist. So it's not always possible for them to meet the criteria um, that is part of um, this, this housing program. Prime Minister Andrew Holness revealed that the house cost $5.8 million. And although at no cost to Mr. Graham, for the taxpayers, not so much. Your role in all of this, Mr. Graham, is that there is a social contract that you must sign, meaning that you and your household, having received this benefit, must pay back the society by ensuring that you are law-abiding, productive, and participating citizens in your country. But according to residents, that won't be a problem for Mr. Graham or his son. As Mr. Colin is a man who always independent, go around and taking picture, he struggle with his son, him alone with the little boy, church coming back. He's a great father. Jamila Maitland, TVJ News. And we'll have more stories after this short break. Welcome back. We're continuing the news. Reactions this afternoon to the government's plan to make changes to the Bail Act. A new Bail Act is to be tabled soon, and Minister of Legal and Constitutional Affairs Mali Malahu Fort has hinted that it would exclude individuals charged with certain crimes from getting bail. But the move is not sitting well with some players in the legal community. According to Minister of Legal and Constitutional Affairs Marlene Malahu Fort, the new Bail Act could see persons charged with gun-related offenses denied bail. She made the disclosure during her sectoral presentation in the House of Representatives on Tuesday. Since then, reactions from members of the legal community. Our constitution starts by recognizing the entitlement to bail, the right to liberty, and um, the innocent until proven guilty. Presumption of innocence. Um, those are three rights recognized by our constitution. So I'd love to see how the government deals with that. Mrs. Malahu Fort defended the move when she spoke on the morning agenda on Power 106 Wednesday morning. She says while the granting of bail is an entitlement, something needs to be done about crimes being committed by persons while out on bail. We in the parliament have to look at broader issues when we legislate. So the current Bail Act um, provides guide for the court, criteria that the court 
must consider in exercising its discretion or um, in the grant of bail. But attorney at law, Isaac Buchanan, sees things differently. He believes the government's current push to amend the Bail Act is a step in the wrong direction. The bail is as of right, mm -hmm. and I cannot see, save and except for the protection of the persons and what is already within the Constitution, you're going to have to, I'm saying it again, fornicate with the Constitution and change it in such a way that it re would require a referendum. So everything is just a bark up the tree like a toothless tiger, and we like all things that comes from this government will be challenged in the court. Herman Green, TVJ News. It's now time for the Business Minute. Here's Cody and Barrett. Cygnus Real Estate Finance has forged a partnership with Independent Luxury Hotel Group, the leading hotels of the world. Cygnus Mami Bay property is the first to be accepted in the group. The resort should be completed by late 2024 and will have 250 rooms. The resort is being developed at a cost of 265 million US dollars. Cygnus Real Estate Finance says the Mami Bay project is the first of a series of similar luxury projects in other highly sought after destinations across the region. The company says it is actively exploring projects in the Dominican Republic and St. Lucia. And in business internationally, the UK economy will grow slower than expected this year and will stagnate next year. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development expects the UK economy to grow by 3.6% this year, followed by 0% growth next year. It means the UK will go from the second fastest growing economy in the G7 group of industrial nations to the slowest growing in 2023. And that's it for the Business Minute. I'm Cody Ann Barrett. And here's a preview of what's coming up in this evening's health report. In this evening's health report, we look at hand, foot and mouth disease. You can detect it from the signs and symptoms just discussed. It can also be detected in stool, by the way. And it's an important point I need to emphasize that it is actually found in stool up to six weeks after the infection. This therefore means that the stool could be a source of spread in a family and therefore good hygiene practices will be necessary. Sometimes if you're uncertain of, as to what is happening, you can do a biopsy or sometimes you can do a blood test using PCT, polymerase chain reaction, in order to PCR testing in order to identify it. That's the health report in primetime news at 7. And now for today's health living tip. If you have hand, foot and mouth disease, you are encouraged to suck on ice pops or ice chips, drink cold beverages such as milk or ice water, avoid acidic foods and beverages such as citrus fruits, fruit drinks and soda, and avoid salty or spicy foods. And Sandy Williams has our regional and international news roundup. In regional news, law enforcement officials are continuing the search for six members of Haiti's Special Olympics delegation who disappeared after checking into their hotel on Monday. The six men are associated with the country's soccer team participating in the Special Olympics USA Games now underway in Orlando. The police said that the group was last seen Monday afternoon at the ESPN Wide World of Sports Complex all six men left behind their personal belongings. Authorities have said they don't believe the health and safety of the group are at risk and foul play is not suspected. And we take another break here on the Midday News, but when we return, Renardo Brown will have your Midday Sports Report. Welcome back. It's now time for your Midday Sports. I'm Renardo Brown. Now set 306 for victory, host Pakistan at Sportstown reached 111 for one this in their first one-day international against the West Indies at the Moulton Cricket Stadium. Earlier, Shea Hope notched his 12th ODI ton and in the process surpassed Sir Viv Richards, Shivnaran Chandapal and Gordon Greenwich on the list of West Indians with ODI centuries. Hope stroked 127 from 134 balls in the wind is 305 for 6 from their 50 overs. He shared in a 154-run second wicket stand with Shamar Brooks, who made 70. Rothman Powell, 32, and Romario Shepard, 25, also had useful contributions. Harris Roth ended with 4 for 77 for the Pakistanis. 
The Jamaica women's team began their regional T20 Blaze title pursuit with a crushing 78-run win over Trinidad and Tobago at the Providence Stadium in Guyana on Tuesday evening. Led by Chanel Henry's 52 from 38 balls, the Jamaicans posted a competitive 133 for 6. Natasha McLean chipped in with 30. Medium pacer Nisha and Waysom then ripped through TNT's batting with career-best figures of 5 for 8 to blow them away for 55. Henry claimed two for 20. Jamaica will next be in action on Thursday against the Windward Islands. The Windwards and defending champions at Barbados recorded victories over Leeward Islands and Guyana respectively in their opening contest. Now to football, members of the Jamaica Football Federation Executive Committee were locked in an intense meeting this morning as they discussed how a letter was sent from President Michael Ricketts committing to paying Dalton Wint in full for his contract following his resignation as General Secretary on Tuesday. Sandy Williams reports. A letter signed by JFF President Michael Ricketts and addressed to Dalton Wint was obtained by TVJ Sports on Tuesday. In the letter, Ricketts acknowledged the receipt of Wint's resignation, but also stated a commitment by the JFF to compensate the former General Secretary in full for the remainder of his contract. Based on calculation, that severance package could be worth over $9 million. The mystery, however, is who, apart from Ricketts, signed off on the severance package for Wint. When contacted on Tuesday, both JFF Vice President with Responsibility for Finance, Peter Reed, and Chairman of the JFF Finance Committee, Dennis Chung, were not aware of the letter. Vice President Raymond Anderson, who was grilled by reporter Brian Lewis on Tuesday night, hinted that Ricketts may have acted alone. And that has caused some discomfort for JFF executive members, which prompted this morning's meeting. You saw the letter, because I, I heard that there's a letter that, and I mean, I checked, investigate, to find out that there's a letter of such magnitude. So what we'll do, we'll still have the meeting tomorrow to see how to deal with the, the plan. So this, so this letter was put together without the consultation of the executive and the board? I don't think so. The president signatures on it. The president signatures on yeah, it. Yeah, but he's not the board and the, and the executive. I know that. Everybody know the president is not the board, but he's, he can make the executive decision. To so give him that amount? No, he can't. The board will actually have to look at it. Because many are saying it's a friendly package. No, that really, I don't know about the friendly thing. But um, as I said, we'll meet tomorrow. We will meet tomorrow. TVJ Sports also understands that Wint sent a message directly to Ricketts stating what he wants, including being paid per month up to December this year and then be given a full year lump sum in January 2023. That payment will also include a 10% increase for 2023 and in full payment for his vacation days. Sandy Williams for TVJ Sports. Thanks, Sandy. And finally, despite a 3-1 win over Suriname in their CONCACAF Nations League game last night, coach Paul Hall was still not satisfied with how the team executed at the National Stadium. A brilliant free kick from Rafael Morrison in the 16th minute and goals from Junior Flemings in the 43rd and Jamal Lowe in minute 69 gave the Jamaicans all three points. some really good individual performances uh, the, the guys showed a resilient performance it's been a tough few days and uh, they really did put it together I wanted to I wanted them to move the ball quicker but they were in control tonight and they were, I, I wish they would have scored more goals and been a little bit more ruthless but um, it's good to win 3-1 the Jamaicans are now sitting atop the group A standings on four points they're ahead of the Surinamese with the Mexico yet to play a game. The Reggae Boys will meet the Mexicans in their third game on June 14, also at the National Stadium. And that's it for your midday sports report. It's back to the news desk. Uh, thank you so much, Renardo. And that's how we wrap things up here on the Midday News for today. I'm Krista Campbell. Remember to join us again at 7 for Primetime News. On behalf of the news, sports, and production teams, good afternoon.